very interesting presentation um, for just in time. So perfectly. So now uh, uh, it's time for Natalia Torilla. Are you there, Natalia? Yes, I'm here. Can you yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can you. So you have the floor. Um, Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm sharing a presentation. I don't know if you can. Oh. Can, can you see the images? Yes. Okay. Um, well, let me start by thanking the Sitchen team for this wonderful conference. I'm very happy to join this panel and to talk about Juana Manso, a feminist Rio Platense enlightened intellectual who was a self taught writer, translator, teatrista, educator, and philosopher born in Buenos Aires. Um, she sought to promote egalitarian ideas on gender and to fight for the emancipation of women as part of her broad effort to enlighten women, what she called La Ilustración de la Mujer. So, in this presentation, I'll be looking at her rearticulation of the Enlightenment as a philosophical and sociopolitical emancipatory project, specifically studying her feminist ideas in her periodicals and her position on the woman question broadly considered. Um, some of the images of Manso's journals that I'm using here were provided by Maria Vicens, so thank you, Maria, for, for sharing them with me. So before we begin delving into this corpus, I'd like to point out that Juana Manso's way of envisioning the Enlightenment has led me to understand this movement as a global endeavor that develops and blossoms in a variety of transnational networks that transcend the 18th century. So against the diffusionist view of Enlightenment, I argue that this movement was very much alive during the 19th century in non-European territories. Um, as Maricel uh, Melendez and Karen Stolli affirm, and I quote, the manner in which the Enlightenment was practiced in different localities contributed to the emergence of the Enlightenment as a plural phenomenon, end of quote. Although traditional historiography has often overlooked the Hispanic Enlightenment, many pioneering texts on the woman question stem from it, as Monica Wolfer has conspicuously shown. So today I'll concentrate on Latin America and specifically on Juana Manso's periodical feminist press in the hope that examining her own reinvention of the Enlightenment will provide some insight into the movement's historiographical complexity. Uh, Juana Manso produced and um, co-edited feminist periodicals such as O Jornal das Señoras, Album de Señoritas, La Flor del Aire, and La Siempre Viva. These periodicals targeted an emergent female readership and were subscription based. Their aim was to promote the emancipation of Rio Platense women by encouraging their readers to cultivate their intellect and to contest the passive role they'd been socialized into. Manso faced an interesting challenge. She had to appeal to women who had been taught to primarily concern themselves with domestic affairs, fashion, and aesthetics, and who had little or no philosophical or intellectual training, since it would have been pretentious and immodest for a woman to get involved in activities of the sort. In this scenario, Manso's strategy was to combine different sections and genres in her periodicals. Essays about women's subjugation were followed by poems, philosophy lessons, which Manso titles La Ilustración de la Mujer, and where she develops her own philosophical thesis and reflections, fictions in the form of the Fochettin, travel writings, chronicles, theater criticism, and articles about the latest fashion trends. In La Flor del Aire, satire takes on a prominent role as it is used to criticize the corrupt aspects of society's movement. This journal is including sewing patterns, illustrations, beautiness, and sheet music as well. Some of these sections might at first glance be considered frivolous, such as the one devoted to discuss the latest fashion trends or the latest gossip. Nevertheless, I think it would be a mistake to underestimate their importance and social impact. 
As Victor Golkin notes, they help to attract incipient readers. Maria Vicens explains that, and I quote, far from being opposed here, entertainment and enlightenment go hand in hand, end of quote. I would add that in Manso's journals, the so-called frivolous sections were certainly not frivolously written. They exceeded the mere objective of seducing the readership, given that in many cases, they were sociopolitically driven and thus a significant aspect of Manso's overarching enlightenment project. Manso understood that the refinement of women's taste was a key aspect of civilization, provided contributed to the consolidation of a distinctive national and or regional aesthetic. Under the pseudonym Anarda, Manso ironically highlights how ridiculous it is for the Rio Platense women to imitate European fashion, especially French fashion, since these territories are in different hemispheres and thus have opposite seasons. Manso's sensibility to class issues may also be observed in the advice she offers women who lack the resources to buy expensive clothes. Using wit and inventiveness, one can find more economic ways to imitate those otherwise unaffordable creations. Simulating women's creativeness was just one way of invigorating women's cultivation of the mind and intellect. When Manso shifts her attention to philosophical and political issues, such as the woman question, she invites her readers to reflect on the patriarchal injustices they must endure throughout their lifetime, and she founds her defense of women's rights on, on the belief in women's moral and intellectual autonomy, the asexual nature of the soul, and the universality of reason. Manso argues that both men and women have souls with identical faculties given to them by God. She conceives the soul as an immaterial sexless substance. From this premise, she argues that women have the right to exercise their free will without the tutelage of men and to receive a formal education. According to Manso, if women are currently not excelling in intellectual enterprises, it is because they have not received the same education as men. In fact, they are raised to believe that their sole purpose in life is to stay at home and bear their husband's children. Women thus progressively become an object among others in the household as they are reduced to, and I quote Manso, a degrading and blundering slavery, end of quote. Whereas the social destiny of ladies from a wealthy background is to become muñecos and automata de salon, salon automata, those who, become, those, those who come from less privileged origins end up as máquinas vivientes de costura, living sewing machines. And if they don't abide by this imperative, misery will push them to prostitution, Manso Lumigli says. So here's a, a quote from an article she wrote for the journal La Ilustración Argentina. This text is, is very ironic as Manso adopts the voice of patriarchal men who are perplexed with, with the notion of women's emancipation. Emancipar la mujer. How? How could that be? But this kitchen utensil, this procreating machine, this golden zero, this frivolous toy, this fashion doll, may she be a rational being? Emancipar la mujer. And what is that supposed to be? To grant her free exercise of the free will? But if we acknowledge that God gave her will, that he made her free like us men, that he gave her a soul composed of the same moral and intellectual faculties like he gave us men. In this way, women will become rational entities and will cease to be a null value. And what social unrest this may cause, what chaos. So Manso denounces the indoctrination of women who are taught to believe that they are inferior to men and at times treated by their husbands as their property and reduced to mere human female specimens in charge of the perpetuation of the race. However, Manso does not oppose the idea that women may find self-realization as mothers. Her essays may be said to promote the ideal of republican motherhood and the angel del hogar, the angel of the home figure, as Francine Maciel asserts. But that's not the whole story, you know, as, as Harriet Bash was, was explaining in her presentation. According to Manso, in order to become responsible mothers, caregivers, and true companions to men, if they choose to do so, women must first get to know themselves and recognize themselves as autonomous beings 
with an individuality and a dignity of their own. Manso also highlights the sociopolitical dimension of motherhood and of children's education, as it is a way in which the latter become citizens of the nation. In sum, according to the Rio Platense intellectual, and I quote, society is man. He has dictated the law, tough and unbending for women, soft and easy for him. That which is a crime in her is a weakness in him. Woman, as society makes her, is an impossible being." End quote. Hence, the way in which women are brought up and socialized needs to change radically. Manso observes that from their birth onwards, society's sole incentive for young ladies is vanity, instigating them to compete among, the, among themselves and to envy one another. As a countering strategy, Manso sets out to build feminist genealogies of illustrious women. This exaltation of exceptional women was frequent during the Querel de Fama, but Manso makes it her own. Rather than reproducing previous catalogs of admired figures or important foreign models of virtue, she chooses to underscore the value of women from the South American region and the Argentine Republic. Although she enthusiastically acknowledges the talent of women intellectuals from Europe, particularly France, such as Madame de Stael, Madame de Branly, and Madame Roland, among others who inspire her, she protests that in the Rio Platense region, there had been no conditions for the cultivation of women's minds. This does not, does not mean, however, that there are no exemplary female figures whose story is worth retrieving. On the contrary, Manso focuses on highlighting virtues such as audacity and resilience and offers readers a glimpse into the life of Luisa Diaz Vélez de la Madrid, the wife of General La Madrid, praised for her fortitude during her journey through different South American territories with her young sons. From Manso's perspective, anonymous mothers, daughters, and lovers also deserve praise for overcoming their everyday struggles and the hardships of life as women. And so our author exalts these archetypes as well without concentrating on a specific woman. So, um, to conclude, uh, Manso firmly believed that the use of reason and the subsequent advancement of science and philosophy were effective weapons against prejudice, which she employed to debunk widespread misogynistic claims about women's inferiority and to encourage women as individuals and as social and political and as a social and political collective to think for themselves. Key to her activism was a publication strategy she deployed. Manso created self-sustained periodicals to spread her feminist arguments. She chose to intervene in favor of women's rights through the press in order to reach a wide readership, thus striving to transform philosophical exercise and dissemination, and as she calls it, the enlightenment of women, into a grass movement. These periodicals were devices for the promotion of philosophical and political feminist enfranchisement, designed to make the reader into a modern woman. Manza's pioneering endeavors paved the way for other women intellectuals of the region, and her rearticulation of the notion of enlightenment greatly contributed to the advancement of feminist thought in the Rio de la Plata region of Latin America. Well, that's the end. So thank you very much. <laughs>